This is the first time that H1 ever crossed 100 megaparsecs. All right, you guys might notice that the quality of the picture is a little better here just because GoPro crashed at the most, most crucial moment two weeks ago and... Oh shit, I don't think it got any of a squeezy moment. Moment right now. I think it's frozen. <laughs> I am totally disappointed in you. After that, that's it. I'm going to make Fuji XE3 work for vlogging. I even got a smaller tripod. This is currently my setting right now. Smaller tripod, smaller mic. Sadly, no flipper screen. So today I'm going to be teaching you guys how to take a spectrum with a uh, Agilent. This guy, 4395A. That. Took me a while to figure this out, but I did it and I'm gonna be showing you guys how today. When I say figure out, I actually mean asking around. Look at that red, scary red screen. It's like stuff from the Terminator. This is a trace that I want, but in RF, the good thing about Agilent 4395 is that the frequency overlaps with SR75. If I take a measurement where there's an overlapping area between SR75 and the Agilent, I can correct for an offset that Agilent may have. All right, here I have just plugged in my signal to channel A. So what you would do is, so you want to go to measure, analyzer type, you want spectrum analyzer and you want make you want to make sure that your channel is correct. So here I plug it to channel A, I'm going to use channel A. I'm going to set my frequency, I want it to overlap SR75 just a little bit, so I'm going to start at 50 kilohertz and stop at 5 megahertz, not 5 kilohertz. Ugh, that's 5 hertz, 5 megahertz, there we go. Start at 50 kilohertz, stop at 5 megahertz. I think that's good. What else? You want to go here, you want to go to BPM. We are going to convert this into volt later. Bandwidth 10 kilohertz is fine. If you want the trace to become a little smoother, turn the averaging on. And here's where you set your averaging factor. I'm just gonna give it a hundred. Save. Data only, save ASCII. I'll name this file. So type in numbers, it's done. Okay, I forgot to pick a noise spectrum, so we have to go back here. Here you can see it says uh, spectrum. You, you want that to be spectrum per hertz. To get there you want format, there we go. You want noise spectrum. Make sure this, this is noise right here. And again, you go to format and it will pull up this uh, menu and you want noise spectrum. All right. And now you can see that we have spec per hertz. Where is my data? Can I auto scale this thing? What the f? There we are. There it is. There it is. There it is. So your, your dB per division doesn't matter because what gets saved is the text file. So it's your actual data that gets saved. Yeah, so you can see the unit in this corner here is now actually dBm per hertz which we can later convert into volt per root hertz. I'm gonna talk about that later, but for now, I want to save my data. Done. I'm gonna save you some grief and not make you wait until the data is safe. So let's go back to MATLAB. By the way, I do want to point out that the option for volt per hertz exists on this Agilent, but I find that I have problems scaling the volt per hertz measurement compared to the dBm per hertz measurement. It's just so much easier to just do dBm and then just convert that into power spectrum in MATLAB and just square root it. So I have just uh, saved my volt per hertz measurement. Here I'm going to also get my dBm per hertz measurement and see how that compares. They should be they should be the same. They should have the exact same offset from the SR75 once converted into a proper unit. I'm going to also take a SR75 data. I need a data. It's volt per root hertz is what I want so that we can uh, compare how far off the Agilent is. Boom, done. Oh my God. 
Bobby. First, first, first. Power is V square over R. So when you get the data in DBM, not only you have to do this 10 log 10 business, you also need to multiply by the input resistance, which is 50 ohms. And second, it's not just 10 log 10 power ratio. It's actually power equals 10 log bar. Power dBm equals to 10 log base 10 of power divided by 1 milliwatt. Once I throw that in and convert my dBm per hertz measurement into volts per hertz measurement, now I am equally off by a factor of too low compared to the measurement taken in the unit of volt per hertz. That's it, and I would correct by a factor of 2.2. Now that we convert dBm into volt per root hertz, why is it equal to volt per hertz coming out of the Agilent? The only, the only explanation is that volt per hertz is actually not volt per hertz. The manual for the Agilent is like this thick. I am not gonna go through that. Alright guys, I hope this is useful and I will see you next time.